this week on Q&A. Two historians discuss their work, their profession, and their lives. Richard Norton Smith teaches at George Mason University. He's currently working on a biography of Nelson Rockefeller. Douglas Brinkley teaches at Rice University. He's completing a book on Alaska and the fight to save the wilderness there. He's also working on a biography of Walter Cronkite. Richard Norton Smith, Gordon Wood, historian, writes in the April edition of the American Historical Association magazine, the writing of academic history seems to be in crisis. Historical monographs pour from the university presses at least 1,200 or so a year and yet have very few readers. Sometimes sales of academic books number only in the hundreds. If it weren't for library purchases, their sales might be measured in the dozens. Most people, it seems, says Gordon Wood, are not interested in reading history, at least not the history written by academic historians. Start with that. I would say part of the problem is that there are not more Gordon Woods, uh, distinguished academics who are held in uh, high regard by their peers, uh, who are interested in writing for more than their peers. Um, if you think of people in the past, Arthur Schlesinger, Henry Steele Commager, you know, if you, if you looked at the New York Times bestseller list 40 years ago, you would have found distinguished academics who were interested in reaching what used to be called the general educated reader. I think we live in a niche society. Certainly academics, um, I think, have become ever more specialized. And um, the, the interesting thing is, who are we reading? We're reading David McCullough. Um, you know, we read Stephen Ambrose, Doris Kearns Goodwin. Um, Doug Brinkley, Doug Brinkley uh, and um, there are some academics out there who are writing for a general audience, people like H.W. Brands and others, but, but clearly the trend has been towards specialization, and it, Mr. Lowell, president of Harvard early in the 20th century, uh, who was a humanist and a political scientist, back in the day when political scientists talked about politics, um, said the, the graduate student who came to Harvard um, the mythical graduate student who arrived to study the left hind leg of the Paleozoic cockroach. So academic specialization was a problem a century ago. It's become, I think, even greater today. Doug Brinkley. Well, um, I'm going to dissent slightly from Gordon Wood because I think these academic books have a, a huge amount of importance. Uh, first off, the university presses represent a state. I'm writing right now on Alaska. I don't know how I could write my book if there hasn't been a University of Alaska Press that did a book about the pipeline, that did a book about Charles Sheldon at Mount McKinley, that did a book about the Aleutian Islands in World War II. No, not a lot of readers are going to read about Atu being you know, invaded by the Japanese, so a university press can offer a kind of information that I need to write a more popular book. So I think the problem is money and that these university presses need to be subsidized and they're not getting subsidized. There are all these cuts going on and uh, I'd like to see all of, I'm a huge fan of the university press world and I think academic writing is essential to popular writing because we're footnoting those books all the time. Our guests for this hour, Doug Brinkley, Richard Norton Smith, they're not newcomers to this network. We've <laughs> talked many times and we do this periodically. And, but in order for those who might have never seen either one of you here on this network, we're going to go back to the year that I met both of you on the program we used to do called Book Notes, which was in the same time slot. Let's pick up Doug Brinkley, April 1993, oh. <laughs> and just see what he looks like and what he had to say. Graceland. Why Graceland? Um, well... Why Graceland? Going to Graceland, Graceland. You gotta go to Graceland. It's the it's the second most <laughs> second most visited home in the United States after the White House. Um, Elvis Presley's not a joke, and um, I personally am a great admirer of Elvis Presley. I'm a, I'm a, uh, I think that people that mock Elvis and make jokes about Elvis don't understand Elvis Presley and don't know anything about him. Um, his role in, um, I wanted the students to, to try to deal with some of the issues that Elvis raises. I mean, Elvis is a, Presley is a great figure to look at American social history in the 50s, 60s, and 70s with. And in the 1950s, Elvis was an unconscious revolutionary. That by doing, as I started a chapter by Elvis saying, ah, just, just do what you want to do, um, Elvis was able to, to not listen to what people told him and play race records, with, as they were called back then, um, absorb uh, black music, absor absorb blues, absorb gospel music, 
Perry Como, country western. He sponged up all the American musical forms. Now, 17 years ago, Elvis is the centerpiece of a big event at the museum, drawing people in today. Yeah, I'm staying here at Hotel George, and the whole lobby is Elvis for the News um, Museum. Well, look, um, you know, when I was talking back then about Elvis, um, it's about popular culture in general. I think a lot of times in the United States, academics view like they can't deal with what's around them as being important. Uh, uh, something like Bob Dylan, 50, 100 years from now, so there are going to be 100 university press books about Dylan's lyrics and um, what they mean. But when you're very close to it, it seems like something that you read in the tabloids more. Um, you know, an actor like Marlon Brando today, there's a lot of serious work being done on his method acting. Um, you know, uh, painters who are considered, you know, sign of frivolous in the 60s somewhat, Andy Warhol, for example. There's now museums towards Andy Warhol. We have a lot of geniuses in our midst right now in America um, that uh, we just don't pay that much kind of academic, scholarly attention to because they seem too close for us. Mr. Smith, Can, are you that, as today's as popular culture is tomorrow's history? Are you as interested in pop culture as? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not as as interested. I mean, I I have great regard for for Doug's work in this, and I think he's right that pop culture is a legitimate you know source of of history in the making in many ways. It's a mirror in a lot of ways held up to us. I would be, I suppose, more nostalgic in the sense that I was going to say, remember the day Elvis died was the day journalism changed in America. Because that evening, famously, Walter Cronkite did not lead on the evening news with the death of Elvis Presley. I believe the other networks did. I think he, Cronkite was the only one, a purist who who took the traditional view uh, that uh, this, this isn't news. Um, clearly the trend since uh, suggests otherwise. I'm not altogether comfortable with the trend, but I acknowledge the historical significance of it. Back then you were at Hofstra, you had a magic bus, a bus that ran around the United States with kids in it and taking them to historical spots. Where have you been since 1993? Well, from Hofstra, I went to the University of New Orleans, ran the Eisenhower Center, continued the magic bus programs, in fact, used natural gas buses, and went um, about 17,000 miles uh, on taking students on these semesters across America where we'd go read Willa Cather in Nebraska or Steinbeck in California or walk Martin Luther King's, you know, uh, Atlanta or Truman's uh, Missouri. And so I continued that program and I started doing civil rights bus tours, taking kids mm. on civil rights tours. Interestingly enough, I've participated in two of somebody else's this year. I went with John Lewis uh, on a pilgrimage, a faith and politics pilgrimage, where we went, I spoke on Rosa Parks in Montgomery and went to the Selma Bridge with John Lewis. And then Julian Bond uh, out of University of Virginia runs a civil rights tour and I became the guest speaker of it in New Orleans about New Orleans and the civil rights movement, the Landrieu family, Mary Landrieu, and Mitch Landrieu who's now mayor, and the Morials, Dutch Morial, the first black mayor, and Mark Morial who's the head of the Urban League today. So I was reflecting on race and families in New Orleans for Julian Bond. I then went and taught at Tulane University um, and I'm now a professor of history at Rice University in Houston. I live in Austin, so I divide my time between Austin and Houston, and I have three kids, which takes up a lot of my time, and I'm able to take them now to historic sites and parks that my parents took me to when I was young. Do, do, they, do they resist? Um, a little bit, um, but you know, we tend to go more to like dino parks and things like this. But I'm, uh, I mean, we were just in Waco, Texas, and I took them on a tour of the Dr. Pepper factory. Or if we go to, um, you know, Houston, we try to um, go to the history museum as well as some of the natural history ones. So I'm, uh, it's in my, and I'm planning on taking them to all these places because they mean so much to me. Yeah. With this weekend or coming up right now in, in Washington, uh, we're doing a outdoors festival with the White House where they're trying to look for new historic sites to save, like Ronald Reagan's birthplace mm -hmm. in Illinois is abandoned, or Cesar Chavez's trail out in California, nobody's addressed from the National Park Service. So there's always a need to put new sites in the system. Let's go back to February of 1993, and I'm gonna use the second cut on uh, Richard Norton Smith because it kind of connects in with what was just said here. Let's listen to what you had to say. <laughs> Uh, not a rumor, somebody here told me that they thought you had visited every grave of every former president? Yes, I, yes I, I'm one of those rare Americans who can say that. 
it, it was a, a hobby as a child, a rather unusual hobby, admittedly, um, and sometimes a, uh, an embarrassing hobby. I, I, I uh, contracted heat stroke one day while visiting James K. Polk on the uh, grounds of the Tennessee State Capitol in the middle of August. I would not advise viewers to do this. And I almost got arrested one night, uh, about 7 o'clock at night, trying to find Grover Cleveland in a cemetery in Princeton, uh, New Jersey. You know, when, <clears throat> when Doug Brinkley's talking about the bus and the students, you've almost transferred to being a yearly bus user for other reasons. <laughs> That's true. By the way, Grover Cleveland's not worth getting arrested uh, for. <laughs> I, I would just point that out. Uh, yeah, I've always said that the difference, Democrats uh, demonstrate, Republicans incorporate. Um, and so while Doug really pioneered in the educational use of, of uh, uh, what's been now called history travel, um, you know, for a number of years I've been leading tours of my own, uh, basically presidential tours. And um, we're doing another one this fall in October um, in New York and the Hudson Valley and uh, New England. Uh, fall foliage time, 11 presidents in nine days, and it's great fun. Who and goes on these? You know, it's almost become a travel club. We, with the, the, we've got half the bus full already, and they're mostly people who've been on previous trips. Um, it, it's, it's a, well, you know what it's like. You, you bring a bunch of people together um, who have an interest in or passion for the subject, and there's really nothing, nothing like it. And they, they form bonds, and uh, it, it's, um, it's, as I say, it's almost a club. I was reading uh, Norman Mailer's Armies of the Night just for fun on an airplane the other day, and Mailer gets arrested at the Pentagon, and they all finally get released in the 60s, and he's on a bus, and he writes a beautiful couple pages about nothing like the hum of the bus at night with the road when you're with <laughs> fellow people that creates a kind of ethereal cast. It's a very American feel of kind of just moving for long distances to go somewhere. And uh, I've always felt that it wasn't just the sights of doing the bus, but it was that shared time with people, kind of a community you developed as you move around and talk about history or literature. I hate to say this, I was standing right there when Norman Mailer was arrested. Where I was in the military really? and I can remember him being carried off to the van, which shows me how old I am. But uh, what yeah. Was your, were they, what was your job there? You were I was a public affairs officer in the Navy in the Pentagon and uh, there were, the troops were lined up out there and the kids was were he on being the other side. Was Mailer cooperative? He was not being cooperative. Not being <laughs> And there was, was he sober? Uh, <laughs> there was some question about that. Uh, let's move on. I want to ask you. Oh, I want to ask you a general question about uh, what's going on today. Uh, put this president right now in context of history, not whether you like him or hate him or whatever, but in the context of history. Richard Norton Smith, where is this president? It's early, I know. Yeah, it is early. Um, well, first of all, I would point out that he exists in a unique political culture. Four of the last five American presidents have been, quote, polarizing figures, which I think tells you more about us and, and the culture as it has evolved than it does about them, per se, um, which is another way of saying it's hard. The founders created a system that makes it difficult to do big things, uh, especially fast. There's a, there are reasons why we haven't had health care reform of this magnitude for 100 years since, since Teddy Roosevelt first introduced the subject. So for this president to achieve that, whatever you think of the bill itself, um, in this culture is a historic accomplishment, even more so. I think we all got caught up in the euphoria surrounding Obama's election, the symbolic meaning of that, um, the inauguration day, no one who was here will ever forget that. And I think we forgot that there is still under, the notion that we had overnight become a center left country rather than a center-right country, I think has been tested and I think in some ways disproved, which makes Obama's achievement even greater. I agree with what Richard said. I would simply say that Barack Obama's an incredible American figure. I mean, my, my son Johnny looks at the placemat of the American presidents and all those white faces, and I have him memorizing them, and then you get to Barack Obama. It jumps out at you. Um, the inauguration is going to be a moment talked about forever. Um, I recommend to everybody reads David Remnick's The Bridge, where he covers um, President Obama's life up to becoming president, a brilliant book by the editor of The New Yorker. And Jonathan Alter of Newsweek has a book coming out um, on the first year of President Obama, 
but I think it's been very in, in historical. He sputtered a lot in some ways out of the gate. He did the big bailout um, that General Motors, I mean, the federal government owning 61% of General Motors, that's fascinating stuff. Uh, we're not sure where that's gonna end up. But with the health care, having a year of a slugfest like he had, if he had not passed that health care bill, I think his, his presidency may have been one term. But okay. you know, one, one thing. But, but in, he in did pass it, and I think now he seems to be on quite a roll, and he, he's unflappable, he's zen-like, um, his, his, in this, everybody pulling at him, and he never seems well, to me, lose his cool. Let me inject, though, that if you listen to talk radio, and I listen to all of it, uh, visceral dislike daily, minute to minute, anti-Obama <laughs> constantly. What's that? How's that fit into history? Some of that, I think, is this evolution of the political culture. Stop and think 30 years ago, um, we were a water cooler nation. There was a consensus nation. A, a cold, maybe part of that consensus was, uh, was artificial because of the Cold War. We were, quite frankly, a more civil society. We were a um, you know, you look at the 60s in this town when you had demonstrations in the streets and you had assassinations going on and yet you had, you had Republicans and Democrats working together to pass civil rights bills and other major but legislation. But haven't there been where there's been this? There has been in the past, but think what's different about this. You have the Internet, which affords character assassins uh, a cloak of anonymity. You have a general coarsening of the culture which is both reflected in and I think exacerbated by much of cable TV and much of talk radio. It's all about conflict, about stoking conflict, but, but, and it's but, not surprising that people are let me Let me throw in the Father Coughlin, uh, who had a huge Sunday afternoon audience with 30 million people when we had very few people compared to what we have now. Didn't he play the same role that uh, talk radio does Absolutely. today? Absolutely, and there were a lot of extreme right people that um, the very name of Franklin Roosevelt, uh, they thought he was a communist, a socialist, a Jew lover. I mean, there all sorts of things were thrown at him. But I do think what Richard's saying, I believe we had a watershed mark in the 60s, more with the great, once the New Deal happened, Roosevelt controlled the Democratic Party so so fully uh, when he passes Social Security, you have somebody like Hamilton Fish, a Republican, along with them, FDR. In the 60s, as Richard says, with the great society you had, and uh, uh, Senator Dirksen and, and types, Mark Hatfield types that would vote bipartisan. We don't have that now. I think it's a, was Ronald Reagan said in his diaries, it is a, um, we're trying to roll back the great society. And really from 1980, when conservatism got serious with Ronald Reagan and really had control of the White House and had eight years of good, a good presidency, Reagan, they felt very empowered. And meanwhile, we've had some difficult elections. Look at 2000. Democrats never believed that George W. Bush won. They thought Al Gore won. And then you have the Kerry um, getting beat by W the second time, but there was the swift boat thing. And so it's become now um, how a, a rip and tear atmosphere. I don't think it's unique to American history, but I do think we're experiencing in a, in a very visceral way right now. The, and, and 40 years ago, again, I, I mean, nostalgic for the, for the 60s, but the fact of the matter is the fringe was clearly understood there was a consensus about what the fringe was on the right and on the left. Today, you have television networks that are not only covering the fringe, but sponsoring it, bringing it into the mainstream. So that in many ways, you know, the sideshow is, is crowding out the main tent. And I think one of the real dangers is the media moderates find it very difficult. Watch cable TV. Um, I do. Okay, <laughs> and, and and see how many how many people are on there voicing the need for consensus, for uh, finding a ways to bridge our differences rather than exploiting our differences. That doesn't sell dog food. Well, but let me just throw this in: there are 309 million people in the United States, and three and a half million people watch the top-rated cable news show, Bill O'Reilly. That's less than one percent. Well, look, I think we're ripe for a third party run right now. I mean, if Ross Perot can get, what did he get, 12% um, or was it 18? The first time around, he got 19. 19%. So, uh, I mean, you're dealing with Perot, and who was not a very um, uh, substantial candidate, really. I think it's wide open. Now, people are tired of the Democratic Republican Party, the lobbying, um, the, the food fight, as Richard's explaining it. 
having a credible third party is another question. I see now somebody like Ron Paul might do it, but he's kind of an odd duck himself. And who could come in there and do it? But Theodore Roosevelt did it in 1912 with the Bull Moose Party and split the Republican Party in two. And we're ripe for a new Bull Moose era. The third party presumably would have to be like Perot, something like uh, Perot put <clears throat> the budget deficit on the map. Perot actually made it impossible for Bill Clinton not to address that issue with historical significance. The, the one person out there who presumably is in a position to do that and the resources to do it would be Mayor Bloomberg of New yes. York. All right, we're going to switch subject. Um, this is a stream of consciousness hour, so <laughs> question to both of you, what's the best historical book, <coughs> book of history you've read recently? Um, I would say I've reread David Halberstam's The Best and the Brightest, and I read it not just to look at the Kennedy administration and Vietnam in the 60s, but stylistically. I think Halberstam was the best writer of history in the United States since 1945. I've also read his book, The Powers the Be, about the media um, climate. And Halberstam's ability to use a, a, be a journalist, a historian, and have a bit of a novelist flair uh, in this seamless fashion, seems to me um, that we've, he's a well-known person, Halberstam. I think he's better, um, and I'm sad that he's gone. I was friends with him somewhat, but he was a genius at, at this sort of creative, non-fiction narrative about America. You read Halberstam, you get a real slice of the country. Killed out in California by a young man oh. in a car, uh, what, two years ago? Three yeah, years ago? a car just swiped him up. He was getting picked up at the airport to go give a speech, and a car ran him. Um, in, off the side, and uh, he was killed. Your best. Uh, <clears throat> I would say a wonderful uh, new um, biography of Commodore Vanderbilt, uh, which just won the Pulitzer Prize, I think deservedly, for best biography of the year, uh, by a young, um, extraordinary uh, author named T.J. Stiles, uh, who I believe did a book on Jesse James, which I've not read. But the Vanderbilt book is a classic. It is, um, you know, what a great movie does or a great play does, which is, for a while, it ushers you into an another world with complete credibility. Uh, in this case, it's a perfect blend of biography. I mean, Vanderbilt is a fascinating, larger-than-life, deservedly controversial figure. But it also is a history, it's not just a life and times. You understand the transportation revolution in this country, first through steamboats and then through um, the railroads. You understand the, the growth of capitalism in this country, the intersection of capitalism and politics. I mean, Vanderbilt's life spans basically the 19th century. And it's, a, it's an incredible life, and I cannot imagine anyone uh, telling it better. I happen to have the uh, Pulitzer winners here uh, that were just announced, and in that category of biography or autobiography, uh, T.J. Styles won, as you said. Number two was Cheever, A Life by Blake Bailey, and number three was Woodrow Wilson, A Biography by John Milton Cooper. Blake Bailey is a friend of mine, and um, he is a really fine, he'd written a biography of Richard Yates, the novelist before Cheever, and he had great access to uh, the Cheever archives, and John Cheever has probably influenced uh, more of, of our recent great novelist, uh, A.M. Holmes or David Gates, uh, many others. So we needed a Cheever biography, and um, this book really delivers on it. It, it won, I think, a Circles Book Award. Uh, it could have won the Pulitzer. Brilliant literary biography, and John Milton Cooper in my, has sort of become replaced in many ways, uh, Arthur Link, who used to do all these multiple volumes of, of Woodrow Wilson at Princeton. John Milton Cooper is a professor of history at University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's superb. His book, The Warrior and the Priest, comparing Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson is a classic. And this is the best single volume biography of Woodrow Wilson. So great choices. Have you, one, have you ever won a Pulitzer? Nope. Ever tried? <laughs> well, you don't try. I, I, beginner's luck, I was actually one of the three finalists for the Dewey book. But that, again, that was, my God, that was 27 years ago, and, and uh, no one's uh, no one suggested it. Since. Well, we started out with Doug Brinkley talking about uh, Elvis Presley, and and I know some of your interest. So I'm going to the the drama winner this year oh, of yeah. the Pulitzer, which has nothing to do with history, but it was something called Next to Normal by music by Tom Kitt and lyrics by Brian Yorkey. Extraordinary show. In fact, I'm seeing it uh, tomorrow night uh, for the second time in New York. 
it is uh, it reinvents the Broadway musical, which I know you hear from time to time, but it does so in a way that is both thought-provoking in the extreme and entertaining. Uh, it is about a family that is struggling desperately to stay together uh, while the mother is coming apart at the seams. Uh, it's a story of her mental illness uh, and her coming to terms or inability to come to terms with the death 17 years ago of her son, um, who, by the way, is a character in the show. You learn as the evening goes on that, in fact, this, this boy is dead and has been for a long time. Where, it doesn't does, sound like a subject for musical. Yeah, but where does but, Broadway fit in the culture scheme? Are you a Broadway fan? I am. I'm not probably as much as Richard, but I am. <laughs> Have there been I'm, many historical type well, Broadway shows? I like off-Broadway. Off um, I like. Um, I was a big fan of, and still am, of the original early plays of Sam Shepard um, that he did. Um, they're, they're, they still blow me away, Sam Shepard. He's one of the people that we're talking about that lives in our midst now and writes plays, but I think he's of the caliber of a, a Eugene O'Neill, um, one of the really seminal. And because he mixes Western folklore, um, Shepard, with science fiction, with domestic angst, uh, with, with a kind of a, a sparse American um, poor white people landscape, and uh, they're just um, phenomenal plays. And so, anytime I see any, even any of the Shepherd plays um, being presented somewhere I go to, whether it's in New York or elsewhere. There's a special award given to Hank Williams. Uh, oh, I was yeah. thrilled. He's my, now, where favorite. does he fit in history? Are you? I, I can't imagine you listening to Hank. I'm huge on <laughs> Hank. You got to turn to me. <laughs> I, I will. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but I want It's all his. I want to first start with Richard Norton Smith. Does, does Stephen Sondheim count? <laughs> well, it's his 80th birthday. You know, if he hasn't won a Pulitzer, I think he, no, in fact, he has won a Pulitzer. But he did a Broadway show called The Assassins, which was about assassination of a lot of presidents. Oh, extraordinary. Talk about reinventing, you know, pushing, pushing the envelope. Sondheim's been doing that for 50 years. Um, and in fact, he won a Pulitzer for Sunday in the Park with George. Which, which was, was all about, about uh, the, uh, Georges Seurat, the French pontilist painter uh, who created Sunday in the, in the uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a show about art, the artist, the alienation of the artist, what is unique about the artist, um, why what, artists are what different is, from the rest of us. What impact does is, is Broadway or these Pulitzers have on the society and the way it views history? Very quick. Well, Broadway is much less important to the culture today than it was 40 or 50 years ago when you had Tennessee Williams um, and you had Marilyn Brando appearing on Broadway. And um, it's a different culture. Ironically, it's more profitable than ever. It's arguably more homogenized, which may be one reason why you're drawn to off-Broadway. And I think you're starting to get uh, Hollywood stars getting ready to do their big, big moment on Broadway. I think Broadway's been revitalized um, in the sense that it's it's doing well at box office. It's the, um, the theater district in New York has been kind of cleaned up. It has a kind of a family entertainment feel to it. And a lot of our best actors and actresses are now start, starring in plays. But, but 50, 50, 50 years ago, the soundtrack for My Fair Lady, for right. example, would, would set records. It was mm -hmm. on the top seller list for over a year. 50 years ago, people, the music on the radio was, was coming from Broadway. That's no longer the case. You mentioned Elvis uh, earlier. We are talking about him. There is a Broadway play called Million Dollar Quartet, which is about Elvis and a few others at Sun Records back in 1956 before your time. Mm -hmm. Hank, but Hank Williams, where does he fit in? Historically? Well, Hank is, uh, there's, well, you know, there's a whole um, genre of music based on Hank Williams, which is outlaw country. If you put on a satellite radio, you can listen to that uh, network. Where I live, Austin, Texas, it's all, we're all uh, sons and daughters of uh, Hank Williams. He was just an incredible songwriter, had a, uh, a life of a lot of pathos, uh, uh, died uh, freezing on a, on a New Year's Day in the back of a car in Ohio. Um, but was just wrote so many great songs, you know. You know, um, you, they're 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 kind of endless. But if you go to Alabama, they're really taking him quite seriously. There's a Frank Williams Museum, a home he lived in is being saved. There's statues of him, um, and the same with Jimmy Rogers in um, um, Meridian, Mississippi. Country music, um, Hank Williams, Jimmy Rogers, Johnny Cash, are so much part of the American grain that uh, I can't think of the 20th century without the voice of Hank Williams. So it was great the Pulitzer it, it did is this. interesting. You, you have two sides of this here because it's often said that the Broadway musical is America's unique contribution to the world, but in fact, country music um, is at least as, if not more, distinctly American. Switching subjects again, I want to play for you a, an audio tape. You'll recognize the voice 
and you'll understand that this has never been played before. It's been released just recently. Let's. It's, this is from October of 1968. You have to keep that in mind. Let's let's uh, let's run it. Gordon. Yes. Lyndon Johnson. Oh yes, Mr. President. How are you? I hope I'm not interrupting your dinner. Oh, or no, no. I, we, we finished some time ago. Gordon, we. Uh, I just learned tonight. Our folks have been out looking at these libraries, and uh, is. Is there no way in the world that we could uh, reconstitute as nearly as possible uh, in the president's office at the library, the president's office here? Well, we haven't thought of it, but it's, it's, uh, it's possible. Uh, I hate to bail me a little one out there at the side and say this is the way the president's office looked, and here's his desk, and here's his chair, here's his... Uh, FDR picture. Uh, here's is where all these people sat. Now that is the most attractive thing they tell me uh, to the people who go and hear it is Truman discussing where he sat in this office. Yes, I've seen uh, the one at the, uh, in Kansas of uh, Mr. Truman, President Truman. Lady Bird said, "We well, we have a trouble." She says, "It just ought to be. We just should have thought of it. We just played hell not doing it." And now we got a bunch of can't do uh, philosophy. She says that uh, the ceiling's not high enough. Well, maybe we don't have to have the same height ceiling, but uh, maybe, uh, and maybe we can't have the same oval room. Uh, maybe it's got different dimensions. But it seems to me that if we could, that was October the 10th, 1968, and that he was talking. <coughs> Lyndon Johnson was talking to Gordon Bunshaft, who was a famous architect, and this is right before he leaves office. Uh, you've been involved in a lot of libraries, and you've been to a lot of libraries. Um, how important is something like the Oval Office, or for that matter, presidential libraries? Presidential libraries are essential. Um, they become a, because it gets people out of just Washington to do research. Um, they're all very visited. I just recently spoke at the Kennedy Library, the Reagan Library. When you go to the Reagan Library, for example, you get to see the view of the hills that Ronald Reagan so loved and would horseback ride in. You get to see Air Force One, which they have there. People queue up for it. Um, Carter Library, they have a, a Oval Office, the way it looked when Carter was there, as many of them are redoing. And it helps people um, get, have a sense of pride that a president came from their particular state. What about... Um what, what library, which is your favorite library in the country? You run three or four of them. Well, that's like asking which is your favorite child. I mean, well, what, maybe I ask it this way. No, I mean, <laughs> I'll, tell, well, I'll, tell you, oh, I'll tell you the model. I wish, I wish there was a way that we could go back to the original model where the libraries, relatively modest in size, were put in the middle of a cornfield in Iowa or down the street from Harry Truman's home on Delaware Street in, in, in Independence, or above all, uh, at Franklin Roosevelt's estate in Hyde Park. Um, the idea being that these organically grew out of the surroundings that produced the presidents, their characters, their world outlook, um, you know, and so that Hyde Park is part of the exhibit. Independence is part of the exhibit. Um, beginning with the Kennedy Library, the decision was made, understandably, uh, and I think in part for financial reasons, to align these institutions with universities. And um, that is in some ways a Faustian bargain, as the, the, the library directors discover subsequently and the former presidents discover. What's the George W. Bush library going to look like? You know, I have to tell you, it's, um, I, I, I'm impressed. They got Robert A. M. Stern, a great architect, and I thought, okay, here we go. We're gonna we're gonna try to out Clinton, Clinton, you know, which is a remarkable building. Um, and in fact, what they've done is exactly the opposite. They've created a building that absolutely fits into the existing mm -hmm. SMU campus uh, that doesn't call attention to itself. That is not monumental in in a in a pejorative way. And um, and my sense is I've talk with the folks who were working on it, um, that that carries on inside. That it's, it's, it's a museum about the presidency and what it's like to be president and the decision-making process that goes on, as opposed to a very sort of uh, time-specific, personalized biographical treatment. Do you have a favorite? Um, I like the, um, I 
probably the Reagan Library for its dramatic scene. It's very friendly to do research at the Reagan Library, but I, I like all of them. Uh, in Austin, we have the Lyndon Johnson Library, and I go down to a lot, and that has the advantage of being right in the middle of a campus. Have you seen the, the Oval Office he's talking about wanting to build? I have, and I've seen where he, he has his shower and he has furniture. It is almost like going to Graceland. Elvis wanted all this sort of objects around that people could practically um, study his toenails. He was that uh, deep into it. But one thing about George W. Bush, now that, that library is going to be at SMU. They're doing a great job. North Dallas knows how to do it. They have some history in that area. But it's really the ranch in Crawford that people associate with the Bush presidency. I ask the question, what's happening to the ranch? Is that going to become uh, given to the National Park Service? Uh, today, you look at President Barack Obama, someday, I mean, some people have to worry about the IRS in their lives. He's going to have to worry about Interior Department coming saying, we want your Chicago home. We want your Hawaii home. Uh, and this happens all the time. The most extreme example of all of this kind of presidential site mania is Jimmy Carter's Plains. The whole town's a historic district. And there's a house there that you could stay at, a bed and breakfast, where there's a plaque that says Jimmy Carter was conceived in this house. <laughs> Um, so people go crazy for these presidential experiences down to what kind, what, um, you know, what kind of food the president ate, where did they go to church. Um, so Johnson's not that far fetched in that tape when he's saying people are going to want to know where somebody sat and this and, and what, what about and, the people, how many, the number of people that go there, I mean the numbers aren't great in many cases, and how about the number of people that are researching there? The numbers um, are down. Um, you find in many of these in many of these institutions, their peak years were the bicentennial year in '76. Um, that's in part, I think, because as a culture, families don't get in a station wagon and set off for two weeks in the summer to visit all of these sites the way they used to. Also, I think, frankly, there's a formula there's a, that I think has gotten rather stale. That, I mean, how many times can you visit the Oval Office? And so, I think it's incumbent on planners of future presidential That's libraries to find ways um, to reinvent. Um, How many people go to more than one presidential library? Well, there's a number. You'd be surprised. There are a number. I mean, there are some people who go to all the president's graves. Yes, there uh, are. But, uh, but there are a number of people. I, I would say, with the, obviously, the numbers are up in the aggregate because there's been a proliferation of libraries. But what happens, and this happens at any biographical site, the, as the generation passes away, that had a vivid emotional connection with someone, um, it's not surprising that the numbers should decline. Um, and that's the case of the presidential school, library. Schools go to them. I mean, you get bus, it's wonderful to see busloads of, of young people that live in an area of a presidential library going. It's almost a mandatory field trip, and it helps them think about what the presidency is. Uh, and the films they use in these libraries are fantastic, too. You both are teaching. Uh, you both are writing books. Let's catch up on all that. Who, what are you teaching and where? I'm a professor of history at Rice University. I also work with the Baker uh, Institute at Rice. I'm teaching That's James A. Baker yes. the third. And I do three classes. I do the history of the Cold War, history of the presidency, and conservation history. Rice is uh, one of the best schools in America. I love teaching there. We're one of the top 20 universities by U.S. News. Uh, uh, we, we haven't been hit as badly as some places by the Great Recession. What, so what are you writing? Are going well. Right now I'm working on two books. One comes out this year called The Quiet World, Saving Alaska's Wilderness Kingdom from 1909 to 2010. At the end of it, it's about the Arctic refuge, Anwar, but it's really a fight to save wild Alaska following up on my Theodore Roosevelt book. So I'm looking at Charles Sheldon's efforts to save Mount McKinley. Bob Marshall, who created the Wilderness Society's efforts to save what's today Gates of the Arctic National Park. Um, the whole group of people that lived with wolves and things up in the Arctic uh, that ended up getting this great Arctic refuge where the coastal plain is where our polar bear den, the great caribou herd of America is. The Arctic is our Serengeti for wildlife. And then the whole Aleutian Island chain where they tested two nuclear weapons on the Aleutians. They were going to test another one in Alaska, but it's been preserved and saved and it's probably our single most wildlife rich state um, is Alaska. Then I'm doing a biography of Walter Cronkite. And when's that going to come out? Uh, the following year. I've been working on the Cronkite book for a long time. His papers are at University of Texas Austin. He, they're voluminous, and I've, uh, I'm the historian for CBS News, so I've had some access in those ways too. Can you tell us something about Walter Cronkite we don't know? That he couldn't stand Edward R. Murrow. 
and Murrow <laughs> couldn't stand him. And when Cronkite um, took over to be the anchor, it was over Murrow's dead body. And Murrow, of course, went into the Kennedy administration then. But uh, he thought Walter wasn't an intellectual, that the intellectuals were Charles Collingwood, who had received a Rhodes and went to Cornell, and uh, Eric Severite, the philosopher from Minnesota, where Cronkite was kind of a gumshoe um, UP reporter and didn't have this kind of book learning that um, Murrow thought needed to be his successor. So it's a fascinating chapter. What are you teaching? Uh, I teach an undergraduate course on the American presidency and in the process of developing. Where? A, a graduate course um, at George Mason uh, here in suburban Washington, which is a, uh, a wonderful and in many ways very unusual university in that it is uh, very collegial um, and very entrepreneurial. And those are not traits that one uh, universally associates with the academy. And what are you writing? I am still writing, um, as I have been for the last 10 years, a biography uh, suitably epic of Nelson Rockefeller. You, back in 1993, Doug Brinkley, talked about communicating with parents um, in the Book Notes interview. And it just, I, the reason I want to run this is it shows the difference between then and now. Let's watch. <laughs> How did you stay in contact as you moved around? Um, pay phones. That was a, one of the things is these are, uh, these are adults. I mean, there might be young people, but when somebody's, in, you know, to me, 21 years old, they're an adult. And that they wanted to, they have to call home, they call their parents. Their parents had an itinerary and they knew where to reach us. And um, that was it. I mean, people would make their own phone calls. I wasn't responsible for calls home or to, call, you know, they, they'd have to pay for themselves and do them themselves. What has technology done? I miss the payphone era, Brian. This is, I'm, I'm more old-fashioned than them. you think. I, I'm, yeah. I used to live by, I used to get those little cards, pockets full of quarters. Man, I used to jam them in. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I'd want to do a magic bus with technology today. I can't stand Facebook. I loathe it. I don't like anything that is sort of a new communication form because we're, it makes everybody starts being about themselves and not about the history. Everybody's their own Facebook star. It's very self-referential. It leads to a kind of youth narcissism, and I think t we haven't yet caught up to the downsides to kind of technology. I'm about books, antiquarian books, used books, something tangible that you can touch. I can't stand the whole uh, something like who's burning. Yeah, I'm giving room. you. I'm giving you a cut into the. But I don't, I'm not big on Kindle. I know a lot of my friends in their 20s are. I don't want to read a book on a computer screen. This book, by the way, uh, is a book that we've had out for a long time. This the book about, that will not die, yeah, I would is, say. This is about the fourth edition. Doug Brinkley <laughs> and Richard Norton Smith are involved in it. And uh, it's called Who's Buried in Grant's Tomb, a tour of presidential grave sites. Uh, we have a clip of you talking about your life before 1993 when you wrote the book on George Washington. Let's watch that. Oh, I went to Harvard, I graduated in 75 with a government degree, which with all due respect to the government department uh, was more or less worthless. What did you do then? I uh, kicked around for a couple of years as a freelance writer. Actually, I was an intern at the White House the summer of 1975. and um, During what administration? It was during the Ford administration. And I'm ashamed to say I, I wrote a, a piece about the experience uh, for the Washington Post, which uh, later terminated the program. It was uh, intended to be a humorous piece. but. Uh, was interpreted as something of an expose. About what it was like to be inside the White House. Well, and to be an intern. I mean, there were all, here we were, all of these kids who were there because we knew people who knew people. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot of substance to do. And uh, uh, it, uh, it was a somewhat comical situation. The White House internship is back. Well, I often said, you know, if, if, if Bill Clinton had only read my article, um, and history might have been very different because the, the intern program was in fact killed as a result of that article. And you're right, subsequent presidents brought it back and the rest, as they say, is history. Should there be internships in Atlanta? I suspect there should if, if it's very different from what this program was. Uh, this was really, a, you know, as I say, it was a bunch of, of sort of politically well-connected kids who were, who were given make work. Uh, that certainly was the case with me. What's the best training? Uh, let's make it short because we've got so much more to talk about. What's the best training for someone who thinks they want to be like either one of you, a historian? Uh, get your college degree, major in history, go do perhaps a master's or maybe a doctorate, but um, write all the time. Journal, diaries, read newspapers, read how good people write. You can learn more about how to write good history from reading Tom Wolfe or 
Truman Capote or Joan Didion as much as you can reading an academic um, dissertation like book. Is that Thomas Wolfe or Tom Wolfe? Tom Wolfe of today, who uh, wrote The Right Stuff and, uh, and um, Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, just a tremendous um, so-called new journalist, but just a gifted American writer. What would you do? What would you recommend? I would agree with all that, but with one dissent. I would, uh, I would side with uh, the late, great Barbara Tuckman, who said the best thing that ever happened to her was not getting uh, a PhD in history, precisely because she wanted to write history as literature. Uh, she didn't want to write exclusively for other historians. Who is the best, uh, in your opinion, the best writer of history, not in, in history that you know of? Who would you say wrote the best? Ever or today? No, ever. Yeah, somebody that you. Francis would... Parkman wrote beautifully. Barbara Tuckman, um, unbelievable. Um, and I think David McCullough writes with such grace of our, our today's historians. Yeah, I would certainly agree with all of those names. I think um, I would add an, an academic, distinguished academic, Al Alan Nevins, who's uh, who is, wrote eight volumes about the coming of the Civil War and the war, which is still unmatched uh, for, for both academic rigor and sheer readability. Next subject, oral histories. Uh, here is an excerpt from an oral history you've done with uh, it's Bob Dole talking about George McGovern. It's only it's less than a minute and we can get you both to talk about what role they play. Uh, he had a very compassionate attitude towards the people with whom he disagreed. How else can you explain McGovern and Dole being such good friends? I mean, I used to rail against George McGovern. Today I can't do that anymore because I have such enormous respect for George McGovern and the, the genuine, I'm going to say love mm. uh, and respect between Bob and George McGovern. It's a beautiful friendship. And I, I, yeah. uh, I sat down after the, the Dole announcement uh, in, uh, in Lawrence when we had that big dinner. And my wife and I were having a, a late night uh, snack and uh, George McGovern came in, and we sat down with him and talked for about an hour and a half. And I just came to f see th yeah. that Bob had more influence on him than he had on Bob. Where did you do it, and when did you do this? He's now deceased. That's right. We did it about three years ago. And boy, Jack Kemp, do we miss Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp was a happy warrior. Jack Kemp was a man all about ideas, principles. You didn't have to agree with him. Uh, but the fact is, he respected those who disagreed with him, and he believed that politics, in fact, was supposed to be about ideas and, and not, you know, character assassination or trivial, you know, tactics of the moment. Um, we could use more people like What's him. this project about, though? How, it how was the Dole Institute undertook an oral history project, did about 80 interviews, primarily with senatorial colleagues. At his insistence, he didn't want it to be a purely biographical project. He wanted it to be about Congress. He wanted to go to the practitioners and get them to explain. Uh, because notwithstanding C-SPAN, I think there's a huge lack of knowledge about how this town works, how Congress works. And one of the things that the Dole Institute and many other congressional study centers devote themselves is, is to trying to address that. Well, what are the rules? In other words, when you go into interview and you're also doing some uh, some work for the uh, Gerald R. Ford Foundation. Yeah we're doing close to 200 interviews with people who have known President and Mrs. Ford. How do you do it? I mean how is it set up and what kind of rules are there about people that talk? Can they, I mean do you release it right away? No, you, no, I, again everyone has their own uh, own approach to this. Um, you want people to be candid, you want people to feel comfortable and particularly there is a debate about whether you should use a camera or not. And there are those who say, well, people will be less candid if they know they're being videotaped. My experience is, is exactly the opposite. If they're comfortable with the interviewer um, and, and the subject. And so basically, for example, the Ford Project, um, all of these are being videotaped. Um, they will be held initially by the foundation, which is the private organization sponsoring this. None of them will be released before 2013, which is the Ford Centenary. They may be held for a biography. They may wind up on the web. They may find their way into new museum exhibits. Eventually, they'll be in the, uh, in the library where anyone can have access to them. Tell us something you've learned in this process that we don't know. Oh, gosh, I learned lots of things. Um, Just one thing. Gerald Ford is a, is a much more complicated figure than he went on. We talked to Lee Hamilton just a week ago. I had a wonderful conversation with Lee Hamilton. Uh, who had a very interesting perspective. He said, you know, Jerry Ford was very ambitious, but he hid it. He concealed it. This town is full of ambitious people who don't conceal it. 
And one of the secrets of his success, why he was so liked, and he told a number of stories, and this is from the perspective of a fairly liberal Democrat who disagreed with him on most of the issues, but who liked him immensely, was in fact this shrewd attempt on Ford's part not to come across as typically ambitious in Washington. I remember you doing something like eight hours with Neil Armstrong. I did. We did a long interview with um, Mr. Armstrong at Johnson Space Center right after 9-11. He flew his own plane in from Cincinnati where he has a farm and he was turning 70 and agreed uh, to do one NASA oral history interview and the late Steve Ambrose and I got to do it and we we had Adam and, and it was a marvelous uh, opportunity to talk to him. I grew up in Perrysburg, Ohio, not far from Wapakoneta. Mm. So Neil Armstrong and John Glenn, I love John Glenn. They were both great boyhood heroes of mine. Um, but I've been done a lot, when I particularly ran the Eisenhower Center, we would do uh, World War II oral history interviews. And, and I like talking to soldiers a lot because it's hard to understand battle from a perspective, one general's perspective. But if you can get a sampling of 50 people. I, for example, just got back from Haiti and I went, went around with General Ken Keene, the head of our Southern Command, um, and he's a uh, first um, battalion army ranger. And then looking at the job that our humanitarian army's done in Haiti and hearing the stories of different soldiers of what they encountered after the earthquake, the death and the devastation and the famine and the amputations and the, the tailgate medicine, to just start talking to all these soldiers, my mind said, there's only one way to do this, an oral history project on uh, talking to all these guys, making tapes to capture what it was like when, when the 82nd Airborne first arrived and saw this devastation, you know, over 200,000 people <coughs> killed. But where does it go, though? I mean, where does all this material go, and who listens to it? And is there a chance that no one does? <clears throat> the presidential libraries in their early days had on staff full-time paid oral historians who would go out and collect, you know, all these, uh, these memories. So if you go to the Johnson Library, the Kennedy Library, the Hoover Library, you'll find very large collections supplementing the written record. Because let's face it, we all know, you know, a lot of history doesn't get put on paper. Um, so it becomes available to scholars, uh, and now, because of technology, it's available to the general it's, public. It's a sense of permanence with oral history. In many ways, it's journalism. It's interviewing somebody, except like you do longer form interviews, um, and you get a transcript of that that becomes invaluable to history. The C-SPAN archive is essentially a great oral history project. People are going to be able to look up a name. Later, if it's Neil Armstrong, we'll see every time he ever was on, and somebody will be footnoting those in the paper. So oral histories just add to it. There's a book coming out right now by um, Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s Oral History of Jackie Kennedy, which he did for the Kennedy Library, but it's, it's so long, voluminous, and personal because she trusted him to talk that it's becoming a book in its own right. I wrote a book called The Boys of Point to Huck, where it was long interviews, almost biographies of all these guys, because I was taking them. The point is, they start informing books, these oral histories. I'm going to show you some videotape, uh, something that you participated in uh, in 2009. This is a, will be painful, but it, it, I want to do it for a couple reasons. Uh, and I think you know what I'm talking about here. This is about a minute and 11 seconds. Uh, let's, let's run it. Stone, for the last couple of years, worked for me at Rice University in Houston, and he was my Dartmouth and Yale combined. He would, got so engaged in history and current events that he was literally a, 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 a kind of a, a, a blaze about life. He enjoyed books and learning, Together, we really discovered birds for the first time. We were doing research on the Audubon Society a hundred years ago, and that very minute mindstone had, he got into the difference between each kind of warbler. We would walk together across from Rice to the zoo in Houston and look at the animals and talk because we needed to understand it for the work that we were doing. We went through the presidential campaign together and I try to be a historian who's judicial and Stone would constantly wear in all of my classes his Obama t-shirt, ratting me out to everybody. <laughs> now, um, that was at the National Cathedral and it was a memorial service for a young man named Stone Weeks. 
Um, just give us, I know, I, I, I ran it for a couple of reasons. One, to have you tell us the background, but also about people that work for both of you as historians. Um, Stone Weeks was my personal assistant. He was in his early 20s, had graduated from the University of Delaware. His father, Linton Weeks, was a longtime Washington Post writer uh, running the website for National Public Radio. He introduced me to his son. I hired him when I was working on my book, The Wilderness Warrior, Theodore Roosevelt, um, a book on conservation. He was my, my right and left hand. Uh, we became great friends. My wife, Anna, and I you know, were friends with Stone. We, we, our whole lives became um, interspersed. And then tragically, on the way to a book party of mine, but also to come see his parents here in D.C., um, a truck hit Stone and his brother, and it crunched them like an accordion on a Virginia highway. And both Stone and his brother, Holt, um, it, it just got burned and died. Um, and so it was quite tragic. And we had a memorial service at um, Washington Cathedral for him. And that clip you ran was part of a eulogy. I'm dedicating my book I'm working on right now, The Quiet World About Alaska to Stone. Do you use assistance when you research? No. <clears throat> and that may be a weakness, but I don't know. I wouldn't know how to use assistance. I think you obviously want to be as objective as possible in laying out your information. But I think there's a, a healthy subjectivity in the research process in terms of instinctively knowing which anecdote is going to really shed light on the, which, which quote is, is worth using. I don't know how you subcontract that. How do you protect yourself? Well, it, it isn't, it, it, that wasn't what Stone's job was. It's really mainly to get library books to help me, you know, type up things, to go um, look on the internet for things which I'm not very good at. And also, he was running my, uh, I, got a, I have a busy operation in the sense of people wanting mail and blurbs and recommendations um, and things like that. So he was sort of um, you know, managing that kind of stuff. But I agree with Richard, when you're doing the actual research work, you just have to do that yourself uh, um, because nobody else is going to, if you go look at a paper collection, I'm going to spot something that nobody else can, can right. see. You mentioned earlier, and I have the document here, that uh, this tour you're going to take October 9th to the 17th, a nine-day, eight-night tour of 11 presidential sites? Yeah, 11, pre 11 presidents. There are some multiple sites. Uh, and it's $3,695 a person? That's in, Yeah, well, we're going to the, you know, this is a five-star tour. This is not this is not the the bus tour with students. Uh, you know, the couple nights with the Waldorf and uh, the but Parker you have, House. But you have room left, and we'll have it on the screen. If somebody wants to participate, what do they do? Just uh, they can, actually, there's a website. They can go. Uh, they can Google presidents and patriots, all one word, presidentsandpatriots.com, uh, or they can call two zero two six two one. 7250. Okay, we'll have that on screen, but before no. we shut this down, um, give us an example of a place in history that you think is special, that, uh, you know, one of your favorite places to go back to. Um, uh, well, I guess um, I like quite a bit um, where I was born, Atlanta, because I, um, I've seen that city grow so much. I was born there at Crawford Long Hospital. We used to live out towards Stone Mountain in Decatur. And just to see that city just grow and grow. And I get very moved by the whole civil rights story of Martin Luther King, of Daddy King's Church, of Auburn Avenue, of going to some of the um, southern restaurants that are still around from that, uh, the movement era. And there's nothing to me like going to these sites like Oxford, Mississippi, and Selma, and Montgomery, and Birmingham and Memphis, uh, where Dr. King was killed, and visiting the Civil Rights Museum there. Mr. Smith, how about you? I would say uh, uh, one of my, my first president, uh, uh, go to Plymouth Notch, Vermont. Plymouth Notch is a little town. There are six homes there now. There were six homes there in July 1872 when Calvin Coolidge was born there. Uh, the whole village is a museum. Thank God, apparently through the Coolidge family, it's been preserved. It's a wonderful way to step back in time and experience uh, a very different America. Um, you know, Coolidge is, is a much more interesting character than he has often been portrayed. And in fact, one of the interesting things is, I, I think post-Reagan, we're rediscovering the, the fact that there is an alternative to the New Deal model of the presidency. You're Boston native, Harvard N nearby. graduate. 
Nearby Boston. Lemons Oh, no, Townsend. What a town. Oh, excuse me. 4,000 people. Harvard graduate, undergraduate degree, no doctor degree. Absolutely. And PhD from Georgetown. Yes. Born in Atlanta, but grew up in Ohio. Grew up in rural Ohio, near, and, rural and, outside and of And Tito. your Alaska book will publish on what? Harper Collins is bringing out this December 6th, which is the 50th anniversary of so called Anwar, the Arctic Reserve. And your book on Nelson Rockefeller, we've asked you that for years. Yes, yeah. I get emails from people, their annual, their annual inquiry. I'm about a year and a half from finishing it. Richard Norton Smith, Doug Brinkley, as always, thank you both. For Thanks, Brian. Sure, thank you. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. Up next, the second debate between the candidates for